Hey there, folks. Thanks for joining me again for another scary story. For those of you who are new here, I kindly ask that you please subscribe to the channel for a good night's sleep. That way, you'll never miss out on future horror stories. And for my returning viewers, you know the drill. Leaving a like on this video is a huge help and greatly supports the channel. I also welcome any comments you'd care to leave. Whether it's thoughts on the stories or suggestions for future narrations, your feedback is always valued. Alright, now that the ritual is complete, please make yourselves comfortable, dim the lights, and begin. Did anyone else become a participant in the social experiment known as Flat Stanley? I went to elementary school in the mid-90s, 95 to 2001, and I was in third grade when our teacher announced that we would be taking part in the Flat Stanley project. For those of you unfamiliar with the concept, Flat Stanley was a series of books about this flat kid who goes on all these weird adventures to famous places. New York, the Grand Canyon, France, Australia, this guy went everywhere and was like a flat version of Curious George. We started reading them in class, making them part of our English hour. And one day Mrs. Gazel told us we were going to have a contest. Today's English lesson is to create your own Flat Stanley. It can look however you want but the winner of the contest will get three prizes from the prize basket and be the class's Flat Stanley that we send into the world to participate in the Flat Stanley project. We were all excited. This was a chance to see our work in the pictures that would come back, not to mention get some cool stuff from the prize basket. We all drew out our own concept for Flat Stanley and set to work coloring and designing him. My Flat Stanley was a spy, wearing a big trench coat, a wide hat, and carrying binoculars. He wore his regular clothes under it and he just looked so goofy that I thought I had a real chance of winning. My friend Todd laughed when he glanced over at it, telling me it was cool. His flat Stanley was a football player for the Georgia Bulldogs, his favorite team, and I thought his Stanley looked cool too. So when the class voted on the displayed Stanleys, I figured Kaylee's flat Stephanie would win. It had a sparkly tiara and a ball gown she had made with felt. That was the one I had voted for at least, since we couldn't vote for our own, and if not hers, I figured Matt's would win. His flat Stanley was a truck driver, complete with a net hat and sleeveless t-shirt, and he had put a lot of work into it. I knew some kids thought mine was funny, but I didn't figure I stood a chance. I hadn't used any special materials or done anything really innovative, and I figured I'd hang him in my room when I got him back. So when Mrs. Gazel announced that my flat Stanley had won, I was shocked. I went home that night with a new super bounce ball, a pocket-sized Stretch Armstrong, and an eraser shaped like a Pikachu. I also went home to tell my mom that I had won the contest, and that my flat Stanley would be going out to other schools and other places, so we could get pictures back and see all the cool places he'd been. She said that sounded really neat, and we brainstormed where he might end up. Paris, Disneyland, the moon. We both laughed about that one. Or maybe even at an Atlanta Braves baseball game. We had a good afternoon thinking about where he might end up, and when Dad got home, he joined us in our daydreaming. I went to bed that night thinking of all the cool places Stanley might go and what we might see when he came back. It started out pretty normal. Mrs. Gazel sent the package out to a school the next town over, and they sent us back pictures a week later. Stanley had been to a volleyball game, an art museum, and finally to play put on by the class. They sent it up the road to the next school where Stanley went on a hike went to the zoo and then to a baseball game. It wasn't the Atlanta Brave, it was a t-ball game, but it was still neat. This went on for a couple months, Flat Stanley traveling to Texas, New Mexico, California, Idaho, and Kansas. We hung the pictures up, sent out thank you cards, and talked about the places that Flat Stanley had gone to. It was a good time, and we used it in our geography class to help us learn our states. It seemed that Flat Stanley was in all our lessons that year. Math. If Flat Stanley travels from Burbank, California to El Paso, Texas, how far has he traveled? Geography. If Flat Stanley is at the Alamo, then where is he? And of course English, where we read the books and the letters we got out loud. It was approaching April when we came to class to find that Mrs. Gazel wasn't there. We were all pretty bummed, because Wednesdays were usually when we got our Flat Stanley letters, and the sub told us that Mr. Gazel would talk about it when she got back. There was no Flat Stanley that day, and when Mr. Gazel came back the following week, we moved on to something else. All the Flat Stanley stuff had disappeared from the class, 
and its absence was as noticeable as our missing teacher had been. She never told what had happened, and it was a mystery talked about in hushed tones well into the fourth grade. It would probably still be a mystery if I hadn't decided a decade later to pursue teaching. I'm in my second year of college now, and I've progressed into student teaching. I decided that I wanted to try my hand at being an elementary school teacher, something like fourth or fifth grade, and when they gave me the name of my mentor, I realized I knew her. It was Mrs. Gazel, my old third grade teacher. She taught fifth grade now, her retirement coming up on the horizon, and she smiled when she realized who I was, giving me a big hug. Welcome back, I'm glad to see you decided to take up teaching. Her classroom was in the same room her third grade class had been in, and the kids reminded me a lot of me and my friends when we had been her students. She had a good group. They were hungry to learn, and they liked her a lot. Mrs. Gazel was the kind of teacher who kept kids' attention effortlessly, and I hoped it was a skill I would learn from her. The kiddos in her class took to me pretty quickly, and soon I was teaching classes while Mrs. Gazel just sat back and observed. Something about being in her class again made me remember my days as a third grader at this school, and that made me think about Flat Stanley again. There was nothing like that in her fifth grade class. The kids would have probably thought it was babyish, but it did rekindle some of the mystery I had felt from a decade before. I tried to find a good time to bring it up, but nothing seemed to present itself, until Friday of my second week. I was packing up to leave when Mrs. Gazel offered to take me out for drinks. I was a little surprised, and she must have noticed because she laughed airily at my look of chagrin. What? She asked, her coat over one arm. You didn't know teachers drank? I decided to join her and found a small group of other teachers waiting for us when we arrived. Some of them I knew, most of them I didn't, but it turned out that this was a regular thing for them. They drank and talked about their week, complaining about some students who were especially difficult and generally blew off steam. Mrs. Gazel and I sat in the corner, nodding and listening to them, and she smiled at me over the lip of her fourth glass of wine sometime near eleven. I've been sending glowing reviews to your professors, she confided. You're one of the better student teachers I've ever worked with. I think you're probably a shoe in to be hired at the end of your training period, and I'll recommend you to the principal myself if he doesn't extend you a position. E. I thanked her, sipping my second beer as I took it all in. Hey, can I ask you something? I said suddenly. Neither of us is nearly drunk enough for you to offer me a ride home yet, big fella, she said, snorting into her glass. No, no, nothing like that. Something's always bugged me for my time in your class, and I was wondering if you remembered the Flat Stanley project we did. Some of the color fled from her cheeks, and I could swear she shuddered a little. I'm surprised you even remember that. It was a long time ago. Well, everything disappeared from the class so quickly, and when you came back, you never brought it up again. All the books were gone from the class library. All the letters were gone. Everything was missing. I think we talked about it for half of the fourth grade before something else caught our attention. She looked far away for a moment as if contemplating whether she actually wanted to answer me or not. I think I need a little air. Would you care to escort me? I told I would, and we left amidst a hail of catcalls about cradle robbers and cougars on the prowl. I had taken her arm and she was trying to be unbothered by it, but she was stiff and a little unsteady as we walked out onto the patio. Something had her spooked, and I didn't think it was the half-hearted teasing of her peers. When we came outside, she leaned against the railing outside the seating area, looking at the waves as they crashed against the water below us. I came to lean beside her, realizing she was trying to figure out where to begin, and having trouble getting started. Are you sure you want to know? That's a pretty messed up story, but I suppose we could count it as a part of your education. Maybe it'll help you avoid something that got me in a lot of hot water and canceled the Flat Stanley project for the whole school. I told her I did. Pretty intrigued with what could have happened to make a whole school ban something as benign as a kid's art project. Well, you remember that we sent the little guy around to a school in the next town over? Well, they sent it to another school and that school sent it to another school and so on and so forth. We had about the best result of any other classes getting back twice as much material as is normal. I started integrating it into the curriculum, as you remember, and it was such a huge part of our class. I appreciated the material. Sometimes it's hard to keep kids' attention when they're that young, 
but Stanley really helped. Then, one day, I arrived to find that a new package had come the day before. She stopped, shivering a little as she watched the waves. Someone had sent our flat Stanley back, and I was excited as I opened the envelope. We were starting fractions that day, at least, we were supposed to, and I wanted to see if there was some way I could work fractions into the package. I would get my wish, but not in the way I wanted. I had reached into my pocket for a cigarette, and Mrs. Gazel asked if she could have one. I had never seen her smoke before, but as she inhaled that first mouthful, she closed her eyes and looked euphoric. Flat Stanley was supposed to go to Carter Wild Elementary School in Boise, but it appeared he had gone somewhere else. You're too young to remember it, but there was a pretty terrible person in the Midwest in the late 90s. He was picking up young women who were hitchhiking, and the police would find them later after he was done with them. Somehow, he got our flat Stanley, and thought it would be funny to use him to taunt the police. He had murdered five girls that week. Her voice broke as she said it, the tip of the cigarette jittering as she spoke, and attached pictures of them to the Stanley he sent back. They were horrific, and as I spilled them out on my desk, I recognized what I had at once. She was shaking, and as I put my jacket around her, she smiled ruefully at me. You're a good kid, despite making me relive this. We knew that the kids in my class had all kinds of wild ideas about what had happened, but we also knew that none of you knew the truth. She took a long pull off the cigarette and let the ash dribble down. The first girl he sent pictures of was Ashley Manx. He had cut her chest open, the X going right between her breasts, and skinned her open like some kind of flower. Her face was set in the worst possible look you've ever seen, and right there in the middle of her chest was Flat Stanley. Your Flat Stanley. I thought I got it then, but Mrs. Gazel hadn't even got rolling yet. Then there was Frances Carmichael, the girl he took from the fair. She was looking for a ride, and he gave her one. He cut her arms and legs off while she was alive, burning the wounds closed with an iron so she'd bleed out slower. He finally cut her throat, and after that, he put one foot from that flat Stanley in her teeth and took a picture. He was standing upright, her body on display, and her burnt nubs are something I still can't quite get out of my head. I'm sorry, I started, but she cut me off. No, no. You wanted to know, so let me get it all out. It's like the confessional I used to go to when I was little. If I get it all out, maybe it won't haunt me as bad. He got Don Cambridge and Betsy Cambridge next, split their backs, and made a pair of blood angels out of them. He set Flat Stanley in the middle of them, the crevice between their sides, and snapped a picture. They were still looking for them when they found Ashley. Finally, he got Melanie Fasterly and she was probably the worst. He beat her with a sledgehammer until her bones were like glass shards. The picture he sent back was unrecognizable as a human being, and if it hadn't been for the hair, I would have never known what it was. He stood the cut out between her lumpy legs as if to save her modesty, and she honestly looked about as flat as he was, if you don't count all the bone spurs sticking out of her. Mrs. Gazel's jaw was shaking, the skivering causing her to stutter over the last few words, and when she looked back at me, there was regret on her face. All the alcohol had been burned out of her, the fear having shaken it all loose as her mind remembered what had likely been the worst day of her life. I called the police, of course, but my real concern was for you guys. If this psycho had mailed this back to us, then he had the address of the school. If he knew where we were, then he could pay us a visit and make us his next photo collage, and I couldn't have lived with myself if that had happened. So, I gave the police everything, and they agreed to keep an eye on the school for a while. I needn't have bothered. This twisted fuck had a particular hunting ground, and a particular prey, neither of which were children in Georgia. He never did pay us a visit, but it took six more girls before they caught him. I didn't sleep well until they had him in custody and I didn't sleep soundly until they slipped the needle into him last year. He was a rotten, twisted individual, and he deserved every ounce of what he got. I had to take the rest of the week to recover from his little present, 
and there was talk that they might want me to undergo counseling. When I got back, the school had scrapped all the flat Stanley stuff. It was too much of a risk that some students would get a hold of it next time, and they couldn't have that. Some of the teachers thought we should tell the students. Some of them thought we should tell the parents, and a few of them thought I should be fired for some reason. It was decided that we wouldn't tell any of them, and we would never speak of it again. In exchange for not causing an uproar, I got to keep my job. I thought it was a pretty fitting trade back then. So that's the whole sad story. Cure your curiosity? It did. Mrs. Gazel was right too. They offered me a job at the end of my training, and it turned out it was her job. Mrs. Gazel retired at the end of that year, wanting to spend more time with her grandkids and her daughters. We still get drinks sometimes, and she really is a lovely woman. As for me, I noticed one major part of the contract as it was presented to me. They put it in bold so you can't possibly miss it. And so if you break it, you really only have yourself to blame. Under no circumstances will our students participate in any program that sends documents to other schools or entities without the express permission of the administration. This includes pen pal programs, hands across the water, the Flat Stanley Project, and other affiliated projects there within. I signed that contract 10 years ago and now I instruct student teachers myself. In the decade I've been teaching, I have never broken that rule, and I have Mrs. Gazel's story to thank for that. When you send something like that out into the world, you never know who might answer back, and what they might have to say. It all started a week ago. Someone put a timeout doll at our local playground. If you're not familiar, they're life-size dolls that look like children in Time Out or playing hide-and-seek. They lean face-first against the wall, hiding their faces with their hands. You only ever see the back of them. Some are handmade, using old kids' clothes, a hat, a wig, and some straw for stuffing. The first time I saw one at the playground, I thought it was a real kid. So did my five-year-old. He went up to the thing and asked, want to play hide and seek? It didn't move. I watched from the bench, fear sinking in. Why isn't that kid moving? He or she, it was hard to tell from the long-ish blonde hair and bucket hat, was leaned against the green plastic tunnel that Ryan liked to crawl through. Just standing there, totally still. But as I approached, I saw the plasticky shine of its curly blonde hair the snow-white neck poking out from the shirt's collar. I raised my hand and slowly gave it a poke. It wobbled against the tunnel. It's a doll. My stomach dropped. Is this someone's idea of being cute? It felt like something an 80-year-old granny would do. The type that likes precious moments figurines and buys those hyper-realistic baby dolls. Or maybe it's a prank. I could see a group of teenagers leaving it here, just to freak out parents. Maybe they hide in the bushes and film people's reactions and put it on their TikTok or something. Either way, it creeped me out. Just standing there, totally still, leaned up against the tunnel like that. Its face lined up perfectly with one of the circular holes cut into the tunnel wall, like it was peering inside. What is it? Ryan asked, staring at it. It's a doll. They call them timeout dolls because they look like they're in timeout, I replied. Oh. Then he got on his hands and knees and before I could stop him scooted into the tunnel. Ryan. Hi, he said, his voice echoing in the plastic. Do you want to play? Come on. It has no face. Why does it have no face? Come on, get out of there, I said. The uneasiness in my stomach growing. He finally popped his head out and smiled at me. Can we make sandcastles? Sure, I replied. I hated making sandcastles, getting sand all over my jeans but it was loads better than dealing with this creepy doll. A few days later, when we went back to the playground, it was still there. The after-school crowd was there, running up the jungle gym and racing down the slides. But there was one child that was standing still among the commotion. That stupid doll. It was in the same place as before, leaned against the tunnel. I whipped around, half expecting to see some giggling teenagers filming us but there were only tired zombie parents glued to their phones, chaotic kids racing across the mulch. I went back to my phone, scrolling through the news. When I looked up a minute later, 
the doll was in a different place. It was now leaned up against the slide, hiding its face against the green plastic. My heart sank. One of the kids must have moved it, I thought. I glanced around at all the screeching, whooping kids. Right? I waved to Ryan, about to go down the slide, and put my phone away. I didn't want to take my eyes off him anymore. He waved back, grinning toothily, his bright yellow hat sticking out among the crowd. But there is always something to distract us from our kids. Dirty dishes in the sink, unread emails. There's always something tugging at our sleeve, crying for our attention. And for me today, it was a phone call. As I answered my client's questions about the logo and branding images I designed for her, my eyes strayed from the playground, and when I looked back, I couldn't see Ryan anymore. I dropped the phone and stood up. Ryan! Nothing. I ran around the side of the playground, and that's when I saw his yellow hat. Not on Ryan. On that fucking timeout doll. It was now leaned against the rock climbing wall, hands covering its face, shirt softly rippling in the wind, blonde shiny curls poking out from my son's hat. My blood ran cold. Animalistic fear pounded through my veins. This is wrong. So wrong. I opened my mouth to scream for Ryan. We switched hats! I whipped around to see Ryan standing there, perfectly fine wearing the doll's bucket hat. I let out a breath, sunk to my knees. Thank God you're okay, I said, voice warbling, pulling him in for a hug. I'm okay, he replied, confused. Can we go on the swings? Okay, but first let's switch your hats back. Barely looking at the wretched doll, I reached over and yanked off the yellow hat. Put its hat back on, I told him, and then we made our way to the swings. I spent a while there, just pushing him, enjoying the sunny of cold spring day. The tension began to melt away. Ryan was safe, and everything was fine. Eventually, as the sun began to set, we made our way back to the parking lot. As I mentally thought through the steps of preparing dinner, I needed to cut up some carrots, and did we remember to buy heavy cream? Ryan tugged at my sleeve. Why is it there? No, the doll. It was now at the edge of the parking lot, leaning against a tree. Uh, one of the kids must have moved it out here. Why? They probably thought it was funny. Come on, let's go. We quickly got in the car and drove home. That night, I decided we'd go to a different playground for a few days. The doll was freaking me out too much. Yeah, maybe it was irrational, but no one said we had to go to that playground. I'd take him to the one in Edgewood tomorrow. As I put Ryan's hat away, I noticed several strands of curly blonde hair stuck inside. Actually, more than several. I pulled them out, my stomach turning a little, and then threw them in the trash. Then I sat down, settled in, and took a sip of tea. Just as I was finally relaxing, I heard Ryan's voice upstairs. Mom! I dropped the cup of tea and ran up the stairs. Mom! Mom! He continued yelling, fear threading his voice. I burst into the room. Ryan was cowering in the corner of his bed, covers up to his neck. It's in my closet, he whispered. What's in your closet? I asked, fear pounding through me. The doll. No, it's gotta be a nightmare. I paced towards the closet. The door was ajar, the darkness spilling out of it. With each step, my heart sank further. It can't be. Just a nightmare. I sucked in a breath and swung the door open. No, it wasn't a nightmare. There, in the darkness, stood the timeout doll. It was leaned against the hanging clothes, pressing its face into Ryan's shirts. Its blonde curls shone softly in the darkness. I raced over to Ryan and picked him up out of bed. We're getting out of here, I said, charging out of the room and towards the stairs. It wasn't a possessed doll. Those don't exist. Someone had put the doll there, which meant someone was in our house. Mark it could be Mark. Some sort of sick, twisted way to get back at me for getting the house in the settlement. Did he still have the keys? I raced down the stairs, Ryan bobbing with each step. When I got to the landing, I glanced back. No, 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 no. The doll was at the top of the stairs now, face pressed into the wall. I raced to the front door, grabbed the doorknob, yanked it open, glanced back. The doll was on the landing. And was that a shadow next to it? Someone. Someone standing there. I ran across the front yard, towards the neighbor's house. I pounded on the door, crying. Let me in! 
Someone broke into our house. Please. As I took a final glance at our house, I saw the doll leaned against the oak tree in our front yard. The police didn't find anything. No doll. No evidence of a break-in. With nothing to go on, they left, telling me they'd call if they got in touch with Mark. Ryan and I are staying at a friend's house for a few days, while we get our bearings and try to figure out what's going on here. But I'm worried, because last night when I went to check on Ryan to see if he was asleep yet, I found an empty bed. Ryan was standing in the corner of the room, leaning against the wall, hands over his face. What are you doing? I whispered, tugging at his arm. Go back to bed, now. He turned towards me, hands still pressed against his eyes. He isn't in time out, mommy, he said. I stopped in my tracks. What? He's playing hide and seek, he continued. Now he's hiding, and it's my turn to seek. Children can often be cruel. A kid picks up a toy, and suddenly her hair is being pulled. She accidentally chose the wrong toy, one which was already claimed by someone else. In a sense, they're very territorial little critters. Some researchers theorize that it's an evolutionary trait. Figure out where you belong in the pecking order. Early, I don't know exactly how a green toy tractor would be beneficial for one's survival. Even if it is a perfect replica of a John Deere. Something about projecting parts of yourself onto inanimate objects and therefore extending your survival to that of the object, I guess. I have a fair amount of experience in this department. I grew up in a world without sound. Even if my condition was invisible to the naked eye, draping me like a ghost made out of thick blankets, the other kids knew. Of course they did. This made me a very easy target. Early, my parents made sure to give me all the tools I would need to take on the world. Sadly, it wasn't really enough. One would think being deaf is a shield from the words of others. But words are never the worst part. Disgusted looks after I miss a cue during P.E. Being omitted from band class, even though I loved the feeling of guitar strings against my fingertips. Teachers not bothering putting subtitles on during movie time. Those were the worst parts. The day I met Anton was cold. I remember dragging my feet towards school. Brown puddles were scattered on the pavement, and my, previously white, shoes soaked up the water a little too well to be made out of leather. As I arrived, the bell rang, walking slowly, dreading another day of ableism. I noticed a red-haired boy sitting by his lonesome under the bleachers next to the football pitch. Something about him gave me an impression of inherent kindness. I don't know what gave me the courage to actually be the conversational instigator. Probably the freckles. I'm Sarah. He gently mouthed something back. After that, we spent a lot of time together. At the start, we would wait for the other kids to finish playing their games before swooping in afterwards when no one was around. Two silent, stealthy ninjas on their quest for world domination through hopscotch and basketball. Anton picked up sign language quickly and suddenly I had someone who wasn't of my blood to talk to. However, so did my tormentors. Apparently teenagers are cruel too, and they're more determined. Soon I had heard, pun intended, every insult in the book. But when the words got vile, I would follow the advice Anton gave me. Close your eyes. That's your superpower, he would sign. Now, I think I've made it clear how much this person means to me, and why it hurts so fucking much to think about his fate. Fuck. In university, we both picked up hiking together. The scenery in Sweden is absolutely breathtaking if you know where to look. Anton's favorite part about nature were the sounds. Mine, the smells. I remember that morning in vivid detail. We woke up in the same tent just before the gilded rays of the sun pierced the trees of the coppice. Small particles of pine aroma made their way to my nose, yelling at me, no screaming that they were ready to reproduce. Get of your phone. I had to repeat the signs three times before I got his attention. Fine. Not many gay dudes on Tinder in homophobe city anyways, he replied, referring to the near backwater town where we stayed. We did what we usually did. Started wandering the forest aimlessly, enjoying the many impressions the forest offered. Every time a squirrel scuttered up an oak tree or we spotted a plant we'd never seen before, we stopped. I could mistake these small moments for anomalies in the space-time continuum. They seemed to last just a little bit longer than all the unpleasant ones. I was inspecting a particularly cool rock, probably some kind of granite. 
when I noticed Anton stop moving on the spot. This was indicative of something I could never experience. He was listening for or to something. It kind of looked like he was in a trance of some sort. I made it a game to try to guess what bird had him that enchanted. I made a noise to get his attention, but it was futile. In the end, I just walked up right in front of him. Is it a blackbird? It is a violin. At first, I thought it was a nickname I didn't recognize for one of the local species. So I made him clarify. No, someone is playing the violin, his hands told me. Eventually, he was moving towards the sound. Or so I assumed. I kept asking him questions, but he wouldn't stop. Answering in few words. Magnificent. Stunning. Almost magical. We entered a small grove. A tiny lake placed in the middle was the centerpiece. And on the water there was a rock. On that rock sat a man, hunched over, completely naked with a violin and bow. There was something off about the way he was positioned, almost like he had been waiting for a long time. As if he, or it, could hear my thoughts, he stood up and straightened himself. I'm not gonna lie to you, he was beautiful. Long blonde hair falling down his chiseled body, which was almost glistening in the sun. I would call him the epitome of beauty, but his smile was crooked. Something wasn't right. Anton had stopped to take in the scene but was soon on his way towards the man. I began to calmly ask him to stop, walking backwards in front of him. Soon my gestures were getting more and more frantical as I realized he wouldn't slow down. He had stopped responding to me and seemed completely enthralled with the music the man on the lake was playing. Anton was much stronger than me, so I could never physically stop him in normal circumstances if he set his mind to something. But now I couldn't even slow him down. It was as if he turned into a machine, dead set on reaching his destination. I started shouting, I think. He would just glance at me with content eyes. Not even when he set his foot in the water would he flinch. I started screaming at the man to stop the music, but he just looked at me with dead eyes. He wasn't so pretty anymore. A subtle desperation had entered his expression, and as Anton moved further into the pond, he licked his lips. I felt this awful feeling, like that thing carried a hunger so intense it could only be described as starvation. I let go of Anton's arm and started crying. The man would just look at me, then back at my friend, brandishing an awful smile. I didn't stop crying until Anton's shoulders disappeared, then his head, the pond was deeper than I thought possible, and soon I could barely make out the shadow of the submerged Anton. I tried going after him, but he was determined to keep sinking. Soon I got lightheaded and swam back upwards. Before I breached the surface I looked down, and the last I saw of him was his kind eyes and gentle smile. I feel like he wanted to tell me something. Just close your eyes. I gasped for breath. I started making my way back to the shore. Dripping wet I sat down in the warm grass. The man on the rock looked at me with a certain confusion. I started screaming at him. I don't think I used any discernible words. Angry sounds. Primal sounds. He just looked at me. The confusion was gone. Now he just looked smug, and he started to change. The color of his skin started draining. Soon the perfectly bronze skin was more akin to the grays of boiled chicken. His limbs started elongating to lengths deeply unnatural. His smile grew from something lightly wicked to something nightmarish. Weirdly, I couldn't see the increments of the transformation. Yet he transformed nonetheless. The end result was fucking terrifying. I couldn't move. It stared at me with large, oval black eyes. Earlier I mused on the fact that pleasant moments seem to last longer than unpleasant ones. But this was different. It felt like forever. Then it slowly raised a thin, sickly arm and waved a slow goodbye. The audacity of this fucking thing. It crouched and started climbing down the rock at the pace of a sloth, never breaking eye contact with me. When it broke the surface of the pond, it did so quietly I could tell. The water barely moved and then it was gone, along with Anton. I had to get this off my chest, and now people will know where I went. Even if that thing still occupies the darkest corners of my nightmares, the forest seems to be calling me. Even though my lungs got damaged to a point of permanent remembrance, I dream of the fluttering water. Even though I can't hear his music, I feel something tugging at my sleeves. I imagine the music was a component of something far more sinister, something ancient. 
The beauty of it, however, is that I won't have to be wary of every crevice, nook, and cranny on my crusade. I know where it will be. On that same rock, in that same lake, hunching over that same terrible fiddle. It was like Amazon for boyfriends. According to his bio, Cam was a cat person. His favorite food was sushi, and he loved horror movies. His profile was cute. Cam's photo looked professionally taken. He was a guy in his mid-twenties with a slight curl in his lip that teased the start of a smile. Maybe a little on the pretentious side with the Sherlock-style trench coat, though his eyes were what pulled me in. I don't think I had ever seen that shade of blue, like staring directly into a perfect crystalline blue sky. Not quite natural, but too beautiful to ignore. Cam was perfect. Now I didn't really think this hire a boyfriend thing through. I found the app through a link my friend Hannah sent me. After just getting out of a pretty toxic relationship, finding someone to just hang out with was more comforting than dwelling on a relationship I have trouble even remembering. I don't think I can describe loving someone I don't remember. I have zero memories of him. Only a vague sensi that I was drowning, that I had to run to get away from him. His face inside my mind is more of an outline, a shadow I can't make out. My therapist said it was PTSD, my mind's way of dealing with trauma. I don't know the details, but I woke up in the emergency room with stitches in the back of my head. Hannah was straightforward in her text. She told me hire a boyfriend pulled her out of depression. I was skeptical, though the app looked legit. Like I said, it was Amazon for boyfriends. The interface was cute. When I signed in through my Apple account, the app required a questionnaire after registering. They asked details such as my likes, hobbies and who and what I was in the mood for. The boyfriend TM was a bestseller. I found Cam on the feature page. His reviews were sparkling. I hired Cam for a wedding. He was amazing. So polite, I wish he was my real BF, Lissa. Watched a movie with Cam and he talked all the way through it. Not in a bad way, lol. The movie was terrible. This guy was hot. I fully recommend. Ryan. Hire a BF is amazing LMAO. My friends actually thought we were dating. The plastic thing ruins it though. Mina. Scrolling down, there were even husbands to Husbands were more expensive and could be hired for up to three days. The boyfriend TM, however, was only available for two hours up to a full night. The app intrigued me. I thought it was a joke, but could I really hire a pretend boyfriend? Before I knew what was happening, I was on my second glass of wine, and my credit card was definitely in my hand, squeezed between my fingers. In the back of my mind, hiring a boyfriend was a whole other level of dystopia. However, I was still lying to college friends about being taken. Even worse, I blabbed I was fucking engaged at 23. This was definitely a me problem. My initial plan was to close down the app and install Tinder, but my credit card was feeling heavy in my hand, the corner spiking my palm. Cam was 50 bucks for half a day with him. 50 bucks I would otherwise spend on Uber Eats or over-expensive makeup. Tapping on Cam, my hands were shaking. I was halfway through the hiring process that was settling on a day, a time, and a location when a discounted boyfriend TM popped up. Roman, 23. Leaving soon. Roman had two reviews, which was just a string of heart emojis and another that was hidden. I did see the start of it, but I wouldn't let me tap read more. Hey, isn't this review hidden? The guy's lack of bio was slightly off-putting. No likes or hobbies, not even a favorite TV show. Roman's photo stood out, however. Dark hair that was the perfect kind of messy, freckles, and a faraway look. Half-lidded eyes not even meeting the camera. He looked like a daydreamer. It made sense why this guy was on a discount. He didn't smile in one photo, and not even the teasing smirk I was used to with the others. His available photos were him standing awkwardly, arms crossed across his chest, as if he didn't know where to put them. But like Cam, this boyfriend was flawless. Not a hair out of place. And if it was, that was the style. Each guy had a color scheme and his color was chestnut. His description caught my eye. Perfect caramel-colored curls and eyes like melted chocolate. Roman is our favorite fall guy. An enemy to a lover in three, yes, three, dates. I had to agree. 
This guy embodied fall itself. Every outfit in deep oranges and browns that reminded me of crisp autumnal mornings. I think they were trying to sell college guy with him holding a book and looking uncomfortable wearing a pair of glasses. His last photo was a full zoom in, capturing flawless skin and tawny eyes swirling with flecks of red. Out of all of the guys I had scrolled through, this was the only guy who looked like he had personality. Cam was cute, yes, but Cam reminded me of a mannequin. He was too perfect. Roman's perfection was human enough for him to feel real. Cam was a Ken doll wearing the exact same grin that people knew would sell. Roman was scowling, standing slightly tilted to the left, his hands in his pockets, and then squeezed into fists before settling over his chest. I could practically hear the impatient voice behind the camera. Why are you scowling? Smile. Do you know how to smile? Eyes on the camera. Look awake. You're supposed to look appealing. Why do you look half asleep? He made me wonder what the BTS behind Hire a Boyfriend was. Cam was marketed as true love while Roman was the guy next door who drives you insane, but is also kinda hot. Were these guys strapped for cash and selling themselves out? Was this all an act or were they based on their real personalities? Either way I was sold. Tapping higher, I chose our date to be in the city park at 3pm. The app asked me if I had any special preferences and I hesitated. Call me a donut, I typed. If this thing was legit, this poor guy has a script. I was nervous to meet him. After class in the afternoon, I headed to the park. It was raining, so already the date was going great. The receipt I received in my emails had the exact location. A green bench next to the water fountain. I was five minutes early, already regretting my spontaneous wine-induced decision-making. Scrolling through my phone with clammy fingers, I was trying to cancel when the bench wobbled next to me. Roman, dressed in his usual autumnal wear, a Levi's jacket with jeans and a beanie. He looked exactly like his profile, already scowling at the ground. That exact same faraway look in his eyes. My boyfriend Tem was purposely distancing himself, sliding further away from me. After getting mildly offended, I remembered his standoff attitude and perma-scowl was his selling point. The refusal to smile and inability to compliment me. Enemy to a lover. He was acting. Hi. His voice was a low mumble. Still refusing to look at me, he tipped his head back and blinked at the tree looming over us. It's, um, Jane, right? Yes. I cleared my throat. Hi. I watched his gaze wander, lingering on a butterfly. He folded his arms, pursing his lips. I had no idea what he was trying to say before he let out a groan. I'm not calling you a fucking donut. Ooh, this guy was really getting into the role. I liked it playing along. It's fine, I said with a laugh. It was a stupid request. Roman met my eye, his lip curling. He wasn't laughing. Yeah, it was. This guy was a pro. I thought I'd made a mistake, especially when my boyfriend refused to walk by my side, stalking behind me instead. He took me to a restaurant and bought me the cheapest option indulging in the delicacy menu himself, and spent an hour ranting about birds not being real. I started to realize why this guy was on discount. He was a fucking weirdo. Still though, everything about him was endearing. The way his gaze wandered when I was speaking like I could physically see his mind jetting off to Saturn. Roman played with his hair a lot, twirling a single strand around his index. He ate his pasta like a psychopath, using a spoon instead of a fork and spoke with his mouth full, spaghetti sauce running down his chin. He, unintentionally, made me laugh out loud multiple times. When we left the restaurant, Roman surprised me by slipping his hand in mine, entangling our fingers. His gesture was unexpectedly warm. When we parted ways, he had the slightest curve of a smile hinting that he was getting a little closer to me. That's how hire a boyfriend lured you in. Their guys were like video game characters, I had to pay more to build them. And that is what I did. My friend was an artist and invited me and my boyfriend to her exhibition. I hired Roman for the exhibition, but halfway through the date, he leaned his head on my shoulder, grasping tighter to my hand. He didn't get any less weirder, officially freaking out my friend with the birds aren't real theory. Eve was more amused than scared, immediately asking for his socials. 
Roman said he didn't know what a social was, and she laughed harder. Your boyfriend is amazing, Eve told me over drinks. Isn't he, like, literally perfect? Yes, he was, but he wasn't mine. I started hiring Roman every week, and the more I got to know him, I fell hard. Every week turned to every day. I was obsessed with unlocking his true character and personality. Each time I hired him, Roman would get less standoffish, his barriers coming down. He started to lean into me, squeezing my hand, kissing my shoulder. Cash didn't matter to me. I was barely emotionally conscious when I was entering my card details. Just like the app said, Roman did get closer to me. Fast forward four months, and I was sitting on a park bench with his head sandwiched in my shoulder, cherry blossoms blooming above us. It felt real. He felt real. I can't describe my feelings because I don't even understand them. He was the first man I remember truly falling in love with. When he kissed me, I stopped seeing him as a boyfriend, Tim. Roman was like no other guy I'd ever met. Before him, I couldn't remember having a clear mind. After him, everything made sense. My friends loved him, and I had slowly deluded myself into believing he was real. His true personality was friendly, a little clumsy, but in an endearing way. And he made me laugh. The park was our place, and I enjoyed dozing in the sun with his face pressed into my shoulder. There was just one problem. Roman was still a boyfriend, TM, which meant he was off limits. The plastic tag sticking out of his right temple assured that. If that wasn't enough, the app sent me hourly reminders, warning me to not get too close. I did understand. It was for the guy's privacy and safety. But it's not like Roman wasn't being affectionate himself. The app said zero touching, including kissing, sexual intercourse. He kissed me multiple times, his head correctly leaning into mine. I still wasn't sure if he was part of his obligation as a boyfriend, but it was clear this guy was slowly steering away from the rules. I couldn't resist prodding the tag. Does this not bother you? Roman shrugged, pulling his legs to his chest. Not really, I like the smell of it. Smell? Rowan held out a hand with a small smile, catching cherry blossom on his palm. Yeah, doesn't it smell good? He was talking about the cherry blossom. Something about the way he immediately dismissed the tag put a sour taste in my mouth. No, the thing sticking out of your head, I said with a nervous laugh. Roman blinked, his lips breaking out into a smile. I'm glad we both like it. Maybe he wasn't allowed to acknowledge the tag. Ignoring my twisting gut, I focused on the sunset instead. Blurred reds and oranges streaked across the twilight sky. It was slowly starting to sink in that Roman was not mine. I love you, he said in a low murmur. Something warm dampened the sleeve of my shirt. Was he crying? For a moment my words were tangled in my throat. I think I love you too. I said, my cheeks heating up. Mmm. He sighed, and I was trying to ignore how wet my sleeve was getting. I told you I would come back. He snuggled into my shoulder, and that wetness was dripping down the bare skin of my arm. When he nestled his face in my neck, I smelled it. A tangy metallic scent tickling the back of my nose. Blood. Twisting my head, my right sleeve was drenched with startling red. My neck felt sticky. Blood smearing my shoulder blade. Roman was bleeding. I thought it was a nosebleed when I glimpsed his nose and lips and chin dripping red. But it was leaking from his ears, too. Rivulets of blood seeping from him. While the guy himself didn't move, still smiling, his head leaning on my shoulder. When my body remembered how to move, I jerked away with a shriek. But Roman stayed in the same position. His head tilted. I came back for you. A wide smile spread across his lips, blood dribbling down his chin. And our baby. I didn't respond, pulling out my phone to call an ambulance. Are you happy I came back? He whispered. I was transfixed by the blood running down his face. His head jolted suddenly, his smile dampening before curving into a frown. The man's eyes were suddenly so sad, wandering like he was searching for something. Someone. I changed my MoMA mind. Roman's head jerked again, drool slipping down his chin. I will want to be a dad, Sarah. Roman's words jolted something inside me, a shiver slipping down my spine. I dropped my phone, using my sleeves to stop the bleeding. Grabbing his face, I forced him to look at me. Hey, look at me. The bleeding was letting up a little. 
but it was his eyes that held me in a trance. I fell in love with beautiful, almost unnatural brown. What I was seeing was green, a smear of lime slowly seeping into that tawny oblivion. Roman, I said louder, who is Sarah? His expression crumpled like he was crying, a whole new personality taking over. But he wasn't looking at me. Roman was looking right through me. I love you, his voice broke, but I also love him. I'm not ready for a baby. I'm 23. What 23-year-old wants to settle down with a little brat? His eyes widened, expression softening. I didn't. I didn't mean that. I was talking to a memory. I love both of you. And I want to. I want to make a family with both of you. He shook his head. But not now, Sarah. Sir, there was that name again. Sarah, I said. Can you tell me who that is? The man's gaze snapped to me. Sarah, he whispered. She's my girl. His head jerked again, this time violently. Girl, friend, Roman frowned. She's my girlfriend, he mumbled. I was going to go, back, but I, I couldn't find her. His hands dropped limply to his sides. I looked for her, but they grabbed me. He squeezed his eyes shut. They took me away. When his whole body shuddered, eyes rolling back, I couldn't help myself. Reaching forward with trembling hands and plucking the piece of plastic from his temple. It was like pulling a tag out of a toy, but it kept going, a long plastic thing feeding directly into his head. It was like pulling a tag out of a toy. This thing was a long coil of wire stained red, a metallic plate attached to the end. Biting back a shriek, I dropped the tag, my fingers slipped crimson. This thing was embedded, fed, directly into this guy's head, like a switch had been pulled. Roman's arms fell to his sides. Sarah, he said through a mouthful of red. She's my, she's my, my. He trailed off and blinked slowly. His gaze found my hand where I was gingerly stroking his temple. Roman jumped up suddenly, his eyes frenzied, awake like a startled animal. What the fuck? He shuffled away like I was contagious, diving to unsteady feet. So this was Roman. Who are you? He swiped at his bloody chin. Where's Sarah? When I couldn't reply, his fingers gingerly stroked at his right temple. Fuck. Roman let out a sharp breath. You actually got that thing out. I was shaking, still holding it between my fingers. This thing was warm, thrumming like it was alive. And what is it? I managed to get out. That thing was inside your head. Roman curled his lip, his gaze wandering the park. Where's the exit? What? He grabbed me harshly this time, pulling me to my feet. I was still trying to mentally register the tag feeding into his brain. This guy was not the man I hired, violently pulling me to his side when I could barely stand. His eyes were fierce, hollow, a whole other person taking over him. He was the shadow that had been pushed down, a suppressed memory who was awake and pissed. We need to get out of here right fucking now, he said in a hiss. His fingernails stabbing into my skin hurt, but the pain was enough to snap me into fruition. That app, I said, what is it? Roman's eyes darkened. It's a factory, he tightened his grip around my wrist. Can you help me find my girlfriend? I'll tell you everything, but we need... Miss Doe, am I correct? The sudden voice caught me off guard. Roman looked confused, his gaze flicking behind me. Fuck. His lips formed the word and he stumbled back his hand slipping from mine. Behind us, an outline of a woman slowly bled into the shadows. You. Roman's lips parted in a silent cry. He shook his head, clawing at his hair. The guy let out a spluttered sob, a thin line of blood escaping his nose. You're the bitch who did this to me. The outline inclined her head. I know you have the memory of a goldfish, dear boy. But if I remember correctly, you were recommended to us. I even have your consent if you require proof. His eyes were wide, terrified. You make us sign it! We don't have a fucking choice! That's a rule break. Boyfriends do not swear, unless it's part of a joke and has been given full content by our clients. The woman appeared, no longer a disembodied voice, basking in the shadow of the setting sun, rich red hair and matching heels. She was my age, or a little older. Sculpted in a black suit, this woman was oozing sophistication. She turned to me with a bright smile. Hello, Jane. My name is Lily. 
I'm a customer advisor at Hire a Boyfriend. I am so sorry for the malfunction. Tilting her head, Lily's lips formed a frown. As we explained in our terms and conditions, the boyfriend, TM, does not usually act like this unless considered faulty. However, it is expected from a discounted model like Roman. He is scheduled to be refurbished in a week, so we'll happily take him off your hands. No, Roman whimpered. His gaze flashed to me. Please, help me. His head jolted once again, and he dropped to his knees. That is also a rule break, Lily said. You never directly tell clients what to do. Roman's body shook his head jerking left to right. Get away from me. You are broken, Roman. Allow me to fix you. His eyes filled with tears. Broken? That's right, broken. Sarah. Roman swiped blood from his nose. Is she okay? Is she s safe? The woman regarded him with a pitiful smile. I'm sorry, who? Roman blinked. Sarah. His expression crumpled. She's my... She's m m my... Lily stepped towards him and he shrunk back. The sound of her heels frightened him like he was used to them. Used to her looming over him. A satisfied smile on her face. She's your what? Come on, speak up. He let out a raw cry, clawing at his hair. I don't know, I don't know, I... Come quietly, and I will rethink my decision to convert Sarah's child when once of age, Lily said. The contract was clear. Section 5, Clause 3. Hire a boyfriend are automatically entitled to a boyfriend's offspring. Roman broke down, his head dropping into his lap. I'll go with you. Somehow his eyes were glitching, unnatural blue light igniting around his iris. I'll go go More blood, this time running thick down his face. Lily's lips split into a grin. I'm sorry, Roman, who is Sarah again? He scrunched up his face, fighting to keep his mind. I d d don't know. I hated myself for turning away. After listening to him sobbing, begging for his unborn child to be safe, his mind torn from him right in front of me. I felt sick to my stomach. Lily was reveling in every second. Was this the reality of hire a boyfriend? What about Cam, who was behind his original face? I should have done something. I stepped forward to grasp him and pull him back. When my hands were on his shoulders, the light fizzled from Roman's eyes, sparks flickering out. Like a puppet, he flopped to the ground. In a panic, I tried to pull him to his feet before I was violently shoved back. The redhead nodded to me. I apologize again for the malfunction, Jane, she told me, scooping him into her arms. He looked so vulnerable, a fully grown man somehow reduced to a living toy. Lily bid me goodbye, promising me discount on my next boyfriend, TM. I thought about that day a lot. I went to the cops with a report, only for them to tell me hire a boyfriend did not exist. Apparently, I had been watching too many movies. Two months passed by and Roman never left my mind. In an attempt to forget about him and delude myself into believing I was suffering a psychotic break, I lost myself in podcasts. Anything I could find, I listened to endless hours, blocking out thoughts drowning me. Yesterday. I was making my way back home from class when I walked into a disheveled-looking girl with an armful of missing posters. I already knew who she was and who was on the poster. I was trying to avoid her, but this girl was following me. I could sense her steps getting closer, her breath on the back of my neck. Grief enveloped her in a sickly green aura, pale cheeks and straw-like hair stuck under her hooded sweatshirt. This time, the girl situated herself in front of me red-rimmed eyes begging me to stop walking. I did, coming to an abrupt stop, my gaze immediately flicking to a very familiar face on the missing poster. Unlike Roman, my boyfriend team, this man did have flaws. Crooked teeth flashing a grin and an oddly shaped nose. He was stockier and had the worst fashion sense imaginable, clad in socks and sandals. This time, though, the boy had a different name, Jun. The photo was always different. What I guessed was a collection from her Instagram. This one was particularly heart-wrenching. Roman's eyes were bright and happy. No sign of that hollow cavern I found myself lost inside. The two of them were standing in front of a mirror, his arms wrapped around her. Whatever happened to him after he was taken had stripped Jun away. The girl shoved the poster in my face. Have you seen this man? Jun Laka, 24. Last seen wearing a plaid shirt and jeans. 
Outside campus, I didn't look at the face that had been perfected and molded into the ideal boyfriend. In Tarona, I stared at the girl's bulging pregnant belly instead. Sarah was getting bigger. Please. She whispered, her voice a hoarse cry, one hand cradling her stomach. Have you seen my boyfriend? It was always a no. Swallowing hard, I shook my head. Sarah didn't even acknowledge my answer. She turned and walked away. Wait. Her name tangled in my mouth. I felt like I was floating, my body moving for me. Stumbling after Sarah, I lightly touched her arm and she twisted around, her eyes igniting with hope. Opening my mouth, I choked on my words. I have seen your boyfriend. Jane Doe, oh my god, I haven't seen you in. Years, is it? How are you doing? Sarah's half-lidded eyes flicked to a familiar face behind me. Lily. This time, the woman strutted in a stylish red dress. Her smile was too wide, too many teeth. Jane, can we talk? She asked. Woman to woman. Lily nodded at Sarah's belly. Congratulations, she winked. I hope it's a boy. I had no choice letting her pull me away from Sarah. Lily's grasp on my arm was polite. She dragged me off campus. I thought she was going to throw me into a truck before the redhead came to a stop. I tried to pull away, but her grip tightened. It is quite painful, you know, she said casually. When I frowned at her, the woman prodded at her temple. The neurowire is fed directly into the brain to ensure complete compliance with our boyfriends. Her gaze was across the road, and when I followed her eye, my heart almost jumped out of my throat. Roman. They had cut his hair. He was a sandy blonde now. His color scheme was deep blue, sporting a short-sleeved shirt and jeans. He was laughing, hand in hand with another girl. I'm only going to say this once, Jane, because you are a little too curious. I watched Roman reach for the girl's hand. They must have changed his personality. Now he was smiling and playful, the two of them laughing. But there was a shy side to him, his cheeks blossoming red, fingers slipping through her fingers and entangling them. There are certain men in our society who are born to be boyfriends and husbands. Lily spoke up and I realized she didn't just work for them. She was hire a boyfriend. At hire a boyfriend, we believe everyone should have a significant other they can be with, even if it's for an hour or two every day. She turned to Roman, who was wrapping his arms around the girl, laughing into her hair. The two of them seemed too close. I had a feeling this wasn't their first date. Lily followed my gaze, her eyes narrowing. Do you really think a man like that belongs with someone like Sarah? No, sweetie. As you can see, Roman is currently being hired by Lula, our richest client, a socialite who is considering buying him as a full-time husband. Now she is perfect for him. The redhead turned to me, lightly brushing my hair out of my face, the tips of her fingers tiptoeing across my temple. She had a smile I couldn't make sense of. I have missed you, Jane. If only dear Ben didn't get his own way. She tried to touch me again and I smacked her hand away. I caught a hint of hurt in her eyes. Before she sighed, grasping my chin with manicured nails and forcing me to look directly at her. Sarah is a woman whose boyfriend left her. She does not need any more stress for our baby. Dropping her hand, Lily's tone hardened. If you do not walk away and forget us, I will happily contract Dear Sarah into the Hire a Girlfriend program. And trust me. You, of all people, should know that it will be a very uncomfortable time for her. Would you like to know the conversion process? Well, allow me to explain. Stop. My legs were close to giving way. I won't say anything. The bitch enjoyed my silence. My panicking thoughts trying to understand what she was saying. Or we could make her a wife. There are a lot of lonely men looking for the perfect wife. Look at her. A young woman in her early 20s. Perfectly healthy and beautiful, and she's pregnant, so that's a bonus. Sarah McIntyre is textbook girl next door. Exactly what we look for. Shaking my head, I was trembling, sweat trickling down my neck. Lily's nails dug into my skin. Am I clear, Jane? Or do you want me to say it again? Her lips grazed my ear, a shiver skittering down my spine, bugs filling my mouth. Pain is beauty, after all and we aim to create perfect boyfriends. I'll leave the process to your imagination. Stepping back, I nodded, swallowing about a vomit. Good. She pivoted on her heel. 
Keep walking and you will never see me again. Neither will pretty little Sarah. Her voice followed me home. By the way, it was nice to see you again. Say hello to your boyfriend for me, alright? I don't have a boyfriend. When I returned home, I felt like I was stepping inside a different apartment. Everything seemed just like how I left it, but the house was too... clean. Too empty. Standing in front of my bedroom mirror, I pulled out my ponytail. My fingers lightly prodding at my temple. What did she call me again? Jane Doe. Maybe I was seeing things, but I'm terrified. There it was. How had I never seen it before? With shaky fingers, I prodded the tiny plastic tag sticking out of me. When I pulled it out of Roman, he knew who he was. Who Sarah was and his unborn child. M, was I like Roman? Am I a higher girlfriend? And if I pull this thing out, who was I before? I've found hundreds of blood-stained and fresh tags in my bedroom drawer. Who is changing them? I live alone, but why does my apartment feel so empty? Please help me, I think I'm going crazy.